Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and The Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today, Dan talks with longtime friend of the show, Rick Rule, founder of Rule Investment Media. And today, I have a lot of things to say about copper because it's what's on my mind lately. And Corey has some thoughts about Bitcoin and the U.S. dollar that he'd like to share. And remember, if you want to send us a note, send us your feedback at InvestorHour.com and tell us what's on your mind. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Yeah, I have I have copper on the brain, so I'm I'm it's like I can't talk about anything else right now. It's just I've been writing about copper for days and days. In the here. brain uh, or um, just on the brain? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on the okay. brain, figuratively speaking. Right, okay. Of very good. Um. So, so basically, the the um, upcoming july issue of the ferris report is all about copper and i give like what i think the number one copper stock that you must must own is and i've recommended a really great copper stock and extreme value too so um you know all all, both the newsletters i cover have been are into this and you know i've been following the story and stuff and i know something about it but when i really started digging in like I, there are some takeaways that I didn't expect. Like, of course, everybody wants to be long copper because um, of the green energy push, right? There's this big target of net zero that basically institutions, governments, and, and other institutions, corporations representing 91% of global GDP have committed to this net zero emissions target by 2050. And so in order to do that, there has to be a lot of new green, so-called green power generation and electric vehicles. And all those things are loaded with copper, just loaded with them. You know, cars, electric cars are like three to four times as much copper as a internal combustion engine car, et cetera. And it's like that for all the technologies. You know, there's much more copper per megawatt in a a wind turbine than there is in a fossil fuel generating plant. So, and there's no substitute for copper. Be, you know, it's highly conductive, highly electrically conductive. It's highly malleable. You can shape it any way you want. And it's highly ductile. You can stretch it out and make wires out of it. And, you know, like they use aluminum for the long haul transmission wires because it's lighter. Um, but, it doesn't conduct as well and they so they have to use thicker wires and you know it create there's some corrosion problems and maintenance issues it's just not a viable substitute and silver is a slightly better conductor um but of course it's 100 times more expensive so eh, not a viable substitute if you want to do something electrically you got to have copper and but so so this green thing that's a big part of the story but But that's not most of the demand, what I found out. Most of the demand, like the growth in demand, which S&P Global predicts, like it'll double basically in the, you know, between now and 2050. And, and, And the greatest amount of that is still, you know, in terms of the tons demanded will still be just traditional demand a lot of which about half of which is just construction you know homes wiring and plumbing and things and and, you know doorknobs and all kinds of other stuff and other buildings and and other kinds of infrastructure and i was just like oh okay so the demand is gonna like no matter what the the green energy thing is like gravy right but what really freaked me out is like um, the supply demand equation, like, yeah, I remember here, I remember example, reading some of this b- before and it's, yeah, it, it struck me too when I heard it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just like one little statistic that I found in a really credible source, an S and P global, you know, report called the future of copper. It says, quote, the amount of copper required between 2022 and 2050 is more than all the copper consumed in the world between 1900 and 2021. (laughs) 
Yeah, I found another one that said this. All the copper ever mined, and we've been using copper for like, one source said 11,000 years and another one said 8,000 years. So all the copper ever mined is like 700 million tons. And it said in like the next 22 years, where we're going to need about 700 million tons. Um, or in a 22-year period, I think, leading up to 2050, something like that. I was like, whoa. You know, it's just these huge amounts. And and they're not finding it. Like, they're not making big new copper discoveries. And the grades of copper have fallen. You know, and we'll talk about this with Rick Rule today, too. I, you know, I've got to talk to him about it because it's just, it's on my mind. Um, and he knows a lot about this as well. But I just thought, you know, this, the demand normally, you know, plus the green demand versus a supply situation in which there's just no big new copper mines, really. It's one of my sources that I looked at, like there's a credible thesis, and I put it in my report, that copper, which is below four bucks a pound, will kind of have to go to 10 Yeah, based on historical That's trends. That's what I was just thinking, running through my head. Price higher, and uh, yeah, the, the companies that mine it, Obviously, that would be or, or able to find it. Um, be good for them, and then also this just contributes. It fits in line with my, uh, you know, my idea at least of just commodity prices being higher in general for the next decade or two. Um, as this whole, as you're saying, like as you know, anyway, just given given what's happened in the world recently, but then throw the throw the green energy push as like fuel uh, if that's a pun um onto everything and yeah it's i remember reading some some statistics and some research i think it was from us actually on uh the copper supply and how it's just dwindled over the last couple of years too significantly so like it's in a place of weakness already and demand you know, if these initiatives are to come to fruition, we'll, we'll be picking up for a, a long time. So, uh, you know what? This also reminds me of last week. We talked about the the ten cent nickels, and they were trying to put more copper in them to lower the price, uh, uh, the cost of making them. That's going to be tr- pl- problematic if they they can uh, if the price of copper goes up, right? Yeah, you know, I found out about I I was doing some research about this thing and. And it said that pennies are like, it's like, I think it's like 97 and a half percent zinc and two and a half percent copper. Okay. So like that little bit of copper is just like, you know, blowing the whole thing mm. out. Um, <laughs> it's just crazy. You know, they're going to be made of who knows what aluminum or something soon. I think they were made of aluminum at one point, weren't they? During the war or something during World War II. I talk about the war like it was, you know, 10 years ago or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway. So I, we should look for I'm, that in, I'm, uh, in your little, reports coming up. Yep. Yep. This Wednesday. Um, yeah. So, but you have a particular issue on your mind that we want to talk about that you emailed me about this morning. And, um, you know, I had to chuckle at it. Maybe maybe you can tell the listeners what's on your mind here. Okay, this is somewhat related as we're talking about real things pulled from the ground, I suppose. Um, RFK Jr., who most people probably know is running for president, said at a recent fundraiser that he wants or has an idea to back the dollar by actual uh, things, you know, make it a hard currency again. Um, you know, perhaps start with very small amounts backing T-bills with hard currency like gold, silver, platinum, and the kicker, Bitcoin. And he's obviously, he's been a, a Bitcoin proponent. And, you know, on its own, I, I think it's fairly significant for a presidential candidate who's making a lot of headlines uh, to be kind of overt 
in uh, a pro crypto stance. I think that's just significant on its own, whether it happens or not. I think it just tells you a lot about um, where we're at right now and that um, this can be a viable option. Um, you know, if if he's elected, um, you know, um, a lot of it, uh, you know, whether it happens or not is a whole other thing. But I think it's it's interesting that the idea is being floated out there. And I know our our uh, crypto capital folks inclu- and editor Eric Wade have a lot to to say about this and and um, as it relates to the kind of the future of of currencies and the f- financial system, just generally speaking, as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's what I found is that maybe there's maybe there's a little hope that something <laughs> something like this could happen. I don't know. He's talking about a very small amount to start off with, you know, one percent, but of the dollar in you know, assets. But you know, got to start somewhere. But I guess it's better than zero. Yeah, and he seems to understand the issue because I'm reading through some of what's been put out in the press, and he says fiat currency was quote was invented to fund wars, right? And he prefers, you know, hard currencies because they make it more difficult. And then he says, you can't just print money to fund the war and tax the public through the hidden tax of inflation. So, yeah, the fact that any presidential candidate is dis- thinks this is worth discussing and, you know, he's, you know, his ideas, some of his ideas are kind of out there, I guess, or he, he put it this way. He's willing to talk about things other people just don't talk about again. So, right. You know, I, read, I read a quote from him recently that said, yeah, I've been saying these things for years, but now for some reason, people are finally listening to me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I think it's a similar appeal probably to like Donald Trump because he just sounds different and doesn't talk like other sort of mainstream, typical sounding political candidates who who all sound so much the same. Even when they espouse the opposite views, somehow they all sound like just so similar. Like I never believe them. I always think they sound very canned. I've heard... Um, like what's his name? Vivek Ramaswamy is a Republican candidate, and I don't, you know, I probably I won't even vote because I just think they're all the same, and I don't think any of them will do anything hardly different. Even if they have espoused the opposite view, they get in office, they all do the same thing. They make the government bigger. Period. And so I heard him talking, and I even agreed with a point or two that he was making, but I thought. Boy, he just sounds so smooth. He reminds me of Obama. And I I I don't trust that at all. You know? I don't trust it at all. And I don't trust, you know, any any politicians making promises. But I do agree when you said, you know, hey, there's some hope here. And he just wants to back 1% of outstanding 1% of issued T bills, he says, would be backed by hard currency. Gold, silver, platinum, or Bitcoin is the quote, and I think that's I think that's really cool. I wouldn't mind that at all. No, you know? I, I I wouldn't mind it so, at all. I mean, this is like you know what <laughs> what we've been talking about for yeah. for a long time, and um, it's it won't it happen. Won't, yeah, so but, which means it probably know. won't happen. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, perhaps there's hope. I think. He's also it's he's been taking Bitcoin, accepting Bitcoin as uh, campaign donations, too, which mm. <laughs> which is interesting to me. So he's actually kind of believes in this. And he, a couple is. months ago, he called it an inviolable right to hold and use Bitcoin. Um, that was at a Bitcoin conference oh. back a couple months ago. So, but how about that? Yeah. So. We'll see. Something to, something to keep an eye on if, you know, he makes it to the debate stages, I suppose. It would be nice to hear a actual financial debate um, in front of uh, the country and people that don't normally pay attention or, or you know, don't really uh, aren't aware of how, just how much of the, the fiat currency system has so much to do with what's going on in, in the country. Um, I just think people generally just don't understand it. Um, through no fault of their own. It's just, it's. Yeah. yeah, the problem, I agree. They don't understand. The problem is like, it's one of incentives. No matter 
you know, if Ron Paul was the president, um, you know, if you can print money, you will. I'm not saying Ron Paul would want to print money, but it would get printed somehow. Right. I'm sure of yeah. that. I was always a big you know? Ron Paul fan when I <laughs> first heard his message, too. I was like, oh, my gosh, this makes so yeah. much sense. Thank you. But yeah, too much. In right. fact, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too much for the world. But it's in, it's insidious. And I and I think that, you know, it doesn't matter who the candidate is, who the president is. There's a whole juggernaut that's in motion and can't be stopped. Right. But slightly well, hopeful <laughs> thing. <laughs> but, well, could you imagine it, a world where <laughs> yeah. the dollar is actually backed by real assets like real, uh, you know, actual real estate, you know, that. Uh, that already exists, um, you know, gold again, yeah. yep. Bitcoin. I, and I think it's possible. It's not, it's not impossible. Um, you know, it would change a lot of things, but it's that's no, definitely not did. impossible. It, it, it used to be that yeah. way. Yeah. Gold was money. I mean, the, the century from basically end of the Napoleonic war, 1815 to 1914 was a century of deflation. And monetary strength, generally speaking. I mean, there were episodes in there, but overall, it was a century of of monetary strength. You know, strong money, gold money. Um, there's a little piece of, by Global Fin Data on that um, called a cent. It was actually called a century of inflation, and the opening was about the century of deflation, and the rest of it was about the century of inflation that followed. Um, when the Federal Reserve started in business in 1914, the year after the Federal Reserve Act was passed. Sounds familiar. So, <clears throat> we, yeah, we know this works. I mean, we know, you know, gold being real money works. And, the you know, people who say it doesn't, well, you know, they're just not paying attention to history, I don't think. And and it's great. It's like copper. Part of my, in, in my report on copper, I said, you can't print copper. <laughs> you can't right, print gold. Right. You have to dig them out of the ground, and that costs something. Right. I've always said that I don't care what it is that the dollar could, would be back to. It could be, you know, baseball cards or uh, marbles or whatever. Like, I don't really care what it is. I just want <laughs> something to be tied to it. So I just think a lot of the problems yeah. we have, you know, when you when you cut interest rates to zero and, and devalue the currency, it just devalues everything. Like, it, it, it just... Mm. devalues like hard work or or you know um yeah the cult human culture. being it, like yep. it just it devalues it yep. all and so I, I mean at least clawing that back is a good start you know maybe we're getting there with five percent interest rates so maybe that's a start it is um in a world where where all the money is debt you know that's it's fiat is printable but it's all debt is is the problem like right? the government issues money by issuing debt so yeah, it's imaginary um it's just, you know yeah debt always is at the heart of every usually big big increases in private debt build up uh it's it's at the heart of every financial crisis you know all the big ones there's lots of private debt building up and it's as we are pointing out it's embedded in the very system of money that we have so somebody somebody proposing that we fix that is welcome but you know we know we know it's never going to happen it's a juggernaut it's not going to change and they, these things don't change until they have to right they don't change until you're zimbabwe or something, you know or weimar or whatever right um and even then you know all right. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> unless Zimbabwe. you have an even happier one. To, yeah, Zimbabwe. Yay. <laughs> you know, the $100 trillion bill of Zimbabwe. That's where we're headed in the U.S., folks. And, 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 in, and on that happy note, let's talk with, uh, with my good friend Rick Rule. We, we actually we talked with him a few days ago and recorded a few days ago. And by the time you folks are listening to this, I'll be in Florida at, and Rick and I will be in Florida at his annual conference that he's been putting on for decades and decades. Nothing like it. You meet people that you just can't meet anywhere else. Robert Friedland will be there and um, cross your fingers. I'm, I'm going to see if I can try to get an interview with him um, and lots of other folks. I mean, Jim Rickards, Daniel D. Martino Booth. There's just 
lots of people, and even Bill Bonner and other folks who I've known for years and years. Um, so anyway, we'll, maybe I'll shut up and we'll let Rick tell us about the event since it's his event. All right. So let's do it right now. Folks, the potential as well as the possible peril of AI has captured the world's attention this year. Goldman Sachs says 300 million jobs could be affected. That's almost the size of the United States. Others say it will create trillions of dollars in new wealth. In fact, it's already propelled one company to soar up to a trillion dollar valuation just this year. And today, the global race to find ways to commercialize AI and turn it into profits is officially on. That's why two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Dr. David Eifrig, are teaming up for the first time ever on July 19th to reveal how artificial intelligence has just shattered one of the most important barriers in technological history. The one decision you may need to make with your money right now, even if you don't realize it, and why 2023 will be remembered as the year the great AI race began. With over 90 years of combined investing experience, there's nobody better to cut through the hype, answer all your most burning questions about what AI really means for your money, and help you find the real opportunities to position yourself to grow your wealth as this story accelerates in the months ahead. I urge you to tune in and consider what they have to say carefully. Just head to AIRaceEvent.com for full details. Again, Mark and Doc will go live on Wednesday, July 19th with all the critical details. You do not want to miss this. Head to AIRaceEvent.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates. Again, that's AIRaceEvent.com. It's 100% free. All right, it's time for our interview, and today's guest is my old friend and president and CEO of Rule Investment Media, Rick Rule. Rick, welcome back to the show once again. Dan, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. You bet. Um, so for purely selfish reasons, uh, I would like to talk a little bit directly about your upcoming event, because... I'm going to talk in it, <laughs> and I want lots of people to hear me talk. Um, the thing that I want to impress upon people about these events is like Rick knows everybody, and it shows every time he does any kind of an event. He gets people like Robert Friedland, Bill Bonner will be there, of course, Robert Quartermain, Jim Rickard, Sean Rusin from uh, Osisco, and, and just on and on and on. We could go um, right down the list, and some crazy guy named Dan Ferris, too. You know, how do you, it's one thing to know all these people, but how do you get Robert Friedland to show up at a thing like this? Doesn't he have to come from China or something? <laughs> yeah, Robert, Robert's been a consistent supporter uh, of the conference. I, I think that has to do with the fact that I've been a consistent investor with him for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, during bad times, uh, I've been very useful to Robert. I, I think, too, that Robert, as an example, uh, appreciates my constituency, which is value oriented, not fat oriented. Uh, so I, I think it's useful both to Robert uh, and to myself in direct answer to the question. But really, let's go to why that's so. Let's go to the value offered up by the conference. The first thing that I want to tell your listeners is that this is not a Johnny Come Lately conference. Uh, uh, this conference has existed for almost 30 years. I've put it on as my staff tells me now for 22 of those 30 years. So the conference has stood the test of time. Uh, I think that's one important part of the reason that I'm able to attract the Robert Friedlands and the Dan Ferrises of the world. Uh, they're familiar with the product and the product itself has a franchise. Why does it have a franchise? Well, in the first instance, we present a worldview, uh, a contrarian worldview, a libertarian worldview, a value-oriented worldview uh, that isn't commonly accessible by people in general media. You will not see what we have to say on NBC or ABC or the BBC. Um, Jim Rickards talking about the financial system as 
the former chief counsel of long-term capital management, something that almost brought down the world financial system. Daniela DiMartino Booth uh, talking about the Fed uh, from inside the belly of the beast. <clears throat> Grant Williams, a wonderful uh, commentator who outpolls me at, as best speaker at my own conference. Uh, Bill Bonner, who built a small mailing list from the National Taxpayers Union to the largest independent financial publisher in the world. Uh, it, it is important for people who uh, appreciate an alternate worldview, a libertarian worldview, uh, that these art uh, ideas are articulated uh, and understood. If you agree with that worldview, and I think you must to be a precious metals or natural resources investor, we have wonderful portfolio managers and analysts, people who have been involved in these markets for 30 and 40 years. Not the kind of analysts that you might see at a newfangled mining conference, people who couldn't spell lithium eight years ago, uh, but rather uh, people who have been through the thick and thin of natural resources and precious metals markets so that they can tell you how to implement the strategies that you might hear about from the big picture thinkers, the paradigm guys. But, but it gets much better than that. Uh, we have what we call the living legends, the Bob Quartermains, the Ross Beatties, the Bob Friedlands, the third generation of Lundines, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch talking about the lessons that they learned, talking about how they did it, talking about how you allocate capital during bad markets. By the way, this process of building multi-billion dollar companies has made these people very good investors themselves. One of the things I like to do is ask these guys to name three companies that they've invested in that they don't run. Other people's companies, these are great investment tips, but they're also very, very educational. This is where the rubber meets the road. These are not analysts who failed at supermarkets uh, and then failed at crypto and have parachuted into gold. These are people who have built multi-billion dollar companies in natural resources and precious metals, which is useful. Perhaps more importantly, Dan, uh, at most conferences, the exhibitors are regarded as advertisers. Uh, at my conference, because the attendees have told me this, they're regarded as content. Every public company exhibitor that exhibits, exhibits at our conference is owned by the directors of the conference in their own portfolios. Sadly, Dan, as you know, not every stock that I buy goes up, although enough have gone up that I've done fairly well over time. But it does mean that the process is honest. It does mean that the exhibitors are vetted. This is important because the attendees have told us that they, can, that they want the exhibitors to be vetted. Now, we're going to give people between 50 and 55 hours of programming in four days, whether you attend virtually, that is to say, uh, through the live stream, or whether you attend live, you will have access to all of the conference tapes for six months because it's impossible to absorb 55 hours of programming uh, in four days and, and get all the value from it that you might. Uh, I put on these conferences and I typically re re uh, review the tapes three or four times in the six months post-conference so that even I, the producer of the conference, can get the total value out of the conference, which I couldn't do, in fact, live. Importantly, Dan, we, for 22 years, have offered a gold-plated money-back guarantee. If you pay to attend the conference virtually or in person, and for any reason you don't think that you got your money's worth, email me and I'll give you your money back. I'm delighted to say that for 22 years, we've delivered enough value for attendees that we've had to uh, refund less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the, of the uh, tuition's charge. That notwithstanding, we are confident enough that we will deliver value, that there is an absolute gold-plated money-back guarantee. If you didn't think you got your money's worth, email me. I'll give you your money back. Wow. So after sitting through the whole thing for four days and then thinking about it, they email you and they can still get their money back. That's pretty I've had, uh, you know, I had uh, two people last year email me and say the content in the conference was more advanced than I was capable of processing. Uh, in fact, mm. it was over my head. Uh, in effect, they're saying, I want my money back because you did too good a job. That's okay. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Right. The risk is mine. You know, what I've learned, uh, everybody told me I couldn't do this because of freeloaders. 
uh, I might have had to refund money to 10 freeloaders in 22 years. <laughs> Uh, the truth is that most people who come to a specialized conference like this uh, have a very specialized uh, need for information. And I found them to be very, very good people. Right. It's incredible that you can do this for four days, a four day event. Uh, that's that's pretty rare anymore. You know, you don't I, see that much. I take energy from it. Uh, now, that isn't to say that on my flight home. I don't sleep fairly well. Uh, I, in fact, do. But the truth is I thrive, uh, I thrive on this event. Uh, and it's important that your uh, listeners, those who are fortunate enough to be able to attend the event live, uh, understand that not all of the knowledge comes from the podium to the, uh, to the audience. If you have 500 people in attendance who are high net worth investors who are striving, spending money and spending time trying to get ahead, there's an awful lot of knowledge in the room, too. And accessing that knowledge at dinner, uh, accessing that knowledge at breakfast, accessing that knowledge on the two different boat cruises that we do, uh, which is to say uh, absorbing uh, all of the experience in the crowd is worth at least as much money as absorbing the knowledge that comes off the dais. Hell, simply walking around the exhibit hall, following Robert Friedland at a discreet distance, seeing what companies he invests in, invests in and stops at and what questions he's asking, <laughs> probably worth the price of admission. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Friedland is worth the price of admission. That's for sure. And listeners can learn a lot more about it and even sign up for the live stream if they can't make their way to Florida at rickevent.com, www.rickevent.com. So, well, now that we've done a little pitch for the for the event, um, I want you to know that I'm sitting here looking at screens full of stuff about copper, and there's a headline um, that says, "So you want wind turbines, but you don't want copper mines." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I find this topic of <laughs> copper demand for gr for the so-called green energy transition interesting. Because while roughly 91% of the, of the global economy of organizations, governments, corporations, et cetera, that account for roughly 91% of the global economy have committed to this net zero emission goal by 2050, there are physical limits to this. And I, want, I, I am bullish on copper and I want to continue to be. Um, but I wonder about those physical limits, and I figure if anybody knows something about them, um, you know, it would be you. And I, and I was wondering, like, how worried should I be that that they can pull off enough of this so that we will see a real increase in copper demand over the next, just call it, decade or more? I think that the increasing electrification of the world irrespective of net zero in 2050, is mm -hmm. inevitable and necessary. I would remind many people that the story isn't just about Tesla and electrification of automobiles. It's about a billion people on earth who have no access to electricity whatsoever and would like to live like you and I live. It's about the fact that 2 billion people on earth have no access to affordable and non-intermittent electrification and would like to live like you and I do. It's about the fact that uh, the last great experiment we had in raising the material living standards of humankind uh, occurred in China, where we advanced 240, uh, pardon me, 450 million people from rural penury to at least a lower middle-class existence. Dan, uh, the world needs more electricity and not a little more, a lot more. Do we need wind? Absolutely. Do we need solar? Yeah, but not in Germany where the sun doesn't shine. Uh, do we need nuclear? Of course. And you know what? We need fossil fuels too. Uh, the generation of this electricity, the distribution of this electricity, and the utilization of this electricity requires copper. Lots and lots and lots of copper. But let's put energy transmission and net zero in context, by the way, we're going to do a lot of this context at the conference. Goldman Sachs reports that uh, the world over the last 40 years has spent 
almost $5 trillion on alternative energy net generation. And as a consequence of increasing energy markets, we have reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 81% all the way, 82%, I'm sorry, all the way down to 81%. A $5 trillion investment has reduced the market shares of fossil fuels by 1%. So are we going to need more copper? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Are we going to obviate the use of fossil fuels by 2032? The way our illustrious president says, ain't no way. Uh, Reverting back to copper, even without the increase in demand that we see from the electrification of the world, uh, our economy has underinvested in copper exploration, copper development, and copper production for a very long time because copper has been too cheap. No matter what we do, absent a global uh, depression, we're going to run into supply problems around copper based on current utilization not based on increased utilization. So in the context of copper, uh, assuming that we don't have an ugly recession or depression, we're going to experience supply shortages, inevitable supply shortages, uh, no matter what we do within five years. If you overlay the demand for copper that will come not merely as a context of electric vehicles and distributed storage, which is a fancy way of saying batteries, in the rich world, if you add back the increase in material living standards for the poorest of the poor, something, by the way, that we've done a great job of for the last 40 years, uh, we are going to experience shortages. We're going to have to uh, invest more in exploration for copper. We're going to have to spend more in mine development for copper. We're going to have to increase sustaining capital investments around uh, uh, incumbent copper mines. And we're going to have to change the way that we regulate and tax the copper business worldwide. There are increasing social rents by way of taxes and royalties uh, and increasing social rents, too, that are indirect by way of regulation. Many of your listeners, Dan, Americans, will be horrified to know that one of the best copper discoveries in the world is in the United States. It's called Resolution was discovered 30 years ago when I had hair. Uh, It is over a billion tons of 1.5% copper, three times the average mine grade worldwide, and it's been stuck in permitting for 25 years. It will likely be stuck in permitting for another five years. Now, this might be convenient for the owners in the sense that they're finally able to build the thing right when the world has a desperate shortage of copper. But it it speaks to a a, a broader uh, policy perspective uh, in a world where material living standards are dependent on natural resource activities. You know, if it's tangible, if it wasn't grown or it wasn't mined, it doesn't exist. And the big thinkers seem to have a very difficult time grasping that. They think that prosperity can be legislated somehow that material progress for humankind can somehow be conjured up by the thinking class. Uh, It can't. Yeah, you'd think if all of these big thinkers, as you call them, I like the term, are so committed to all of this, you know, transformation from a fuel-intensive economy, let's just say, to a mineral-intensive economy, that they would kind of pave the way for the production of more minerals. But they seem to be doing the opposite. Um, earlier this year in January, um, there was a Reuters story I saw it says U S bans mining in parts of Minnesota dealing latest blow to what Antofagasta's copper project, the exact thing that we need tons more of. And it's actually a copper nickel project. I mean, you know, if you look at that project, it's a battery project. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have the, the president saying we need more alternative energy and for alternative energy to work, we need energy storage. We need batteries. <laughs> But somehow, I guess he thinks he can legislate copper or something like that. Uh, It has to be mined. Now, in truth, uh, as a a natural resource investor, President Biden may very well be my best friend. Uh, What he does is he constrains supply, which means that the owners of existing supplies, old, fat, bald, white guys like myself, 
get richer and richer as a consequence of his idiocy. Mm-hmm. A- and while I don't condone idiocy, uh, investors need to understand that perversely, uh, these regulations are in some senses their best friend, but they're not good for humankind. Right. And in the long term, our listeners, I know the kind of things they're focused on, and I know one of them in this discussion will be the copper price. And I've been doing some research because I'm writing writing about copper for my newsletter in the next issue. That's why I'm on this topic. Um, and I noticed a couple of things. First of all, the copper price late last century and up to about 2005 this century was sort of bouncing around in the 60 cent to $1.50 range. After that, it's more volatile and bouncing around in like two to five, just call it. And during that time also, I, I saw another chart that showed the decline in grades of copper grades yep. over the last couple of centuries. Yep. And then I saw another chart about the incentive price rising. These things all come together. Do, they, do I have this right? You do. You forgot one. Okay, uh, what is it? That one is the difference between nominal pricing and real pricing. You're pricing them in U.S. dollars. And the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar since the establishment of the Federal Reserve is down by 98%. In real terms, copper is so cheap, it's almost free. But that part is coming to a screeching, screeching halt, precisely for the reason that you identified. The average mined grade for a copper mine in 30 years has declined from 1.5% to less than half a percent. <laughs> and, and you know, Dan... And they're deeper too, aren't they, the new discoveries? Or, or they're in uh, political jurisdictions that we're less familiar with. Your viewers should, uh, in a sense, look at me as an icon for the copper business because the mines all look like me, 70 years old, bald, fat, and past their prime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the big copper mines in the world, think Bingham Canyon, 160 mm. years of age. You know, yeah. the deposit does not get better with age. This is not fine wine. <laughs> uh, Grassberg, 65 years of age. Escondida, the newcomer, 40 years of age. Uh, El Teniente, 110 years of age. Humankind is living off these wonderful mega deposits that were discovered and put into production 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. You do not Mm. stand on the lip of a copper mine, throw in water and fertilizer and have it grow more cotton. Copper, pardon me. You also do not attend a, a great big political forum and legislate copper into existence despite the preferences of the big thinkers. You have to go find this stuff, which is traditionally in district scale exploration, a 10 year process. Then you have to permit it, which if the United States has any indication is a 25 year process. Then you have to finance it. Then you have to build it. So understand in that context, the value of existing long lived permitted producing reserves. Yes, I'm a big fan of those. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the uh, uh, the leverage an investor can get on on those when they're still in the ground and the price is moving. It can do wonderful things for you. So maybe, um, or, or I think I think we've actually done a reasonable job of um, teaching about fishing. Maybe we should throw a fish or two out there. You got a fish or two that you want to? So well, happy to do that. Uh, happy to do that. If you have the courage to take political risk, one of my longest standing recommendations will be at the conference, by the way, uh, which is um, I- Ivanhoe Mines, uh, the highest grade new copper deposit in the world, uh, a company that's absolutely gushing cash uh, and, by the way, is about to put the highest grade zinc mine in the world into production. And after that, we'll put one of the highest grades, but certainly the largest platinum and palladium mines in production. Ivanhoe Mines will be at the conference. Is there risk? Absolutely. They produce in South Africa (laughs) and they produce in Congo, two challenging uh, countries, but three absolutely world scale deposits. Uh, Investors that don't have a sense of humor for that type of risk would probably do well to look at companies like Freeport. Uh, If you look at Freeport on a net present value basis, they're selling at a discount to the net present value of their existing cash flows using a discount rate that's three times the rate of the U.S. 30-year treasury, and you get the upside for free. Uh, 
I think that investors who don't want to do a lot of time, who don't want to do a lot of work and, and a lot of time would be well advised putting into their portfolios the very largest, the very most solvent natural resource companies in the world. So ones that focus on tier one assets that have uh, best quartile all in sustaining costs, best co quartile return on capital employed, and by the way, fairly generous dividend policies. Do they have names? Sure. BHP is a name. Uh, is it cheap? On an absolute basis, yes. On a relevant, on a relative basis, no. Uh, Rio Tinto, you know, absolutely world class asset base. Will it get hurt in a recession? Absolutely. Will it survive the recession <laughs> and, and pay a wonderful dividend stream for thirty years? Yes, absolutely. If you can take uh, the risk of a more aggressive company, Glencore. Uh, lots and lots and lots of political problems. But think about this. Uh, two years ago, understanding that despite the wishes of the big thinkers, Glencore went on a coal acquisition rampage. Uh, they bought out a minority interest uh, in a coal mine with 35 years of proved reserves, and they paid 1.5 times trailing cash flow. For this interest, think about paying 1.5 times trailing cash flow for an asset with a 35 year reserve life. Um, so, are there opportunities in this space? Absolutely, positively. Our conference specializes in copper explorers and producers that are at an earlier stage and not as well known, companies with more risk and more torque. And we will have those. We will have two hundred million dollar market cap Australian companies, the Australian company that uh, controls one of the largest new discoveries, as an example, in Chile. Um, is there risk? Of course, this thing hasn't been financed to production, but it's within thirty miles of tidewater. The Pan American Highway goes right next, you know, goes right through it. It's next to a town, a copper mining town, so that they have access to a, a wonderful asset called copper miners. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities in the copper space. The question is, what type of opportunity fits your needs and your risk tolerance as an investor? Right. Um, you mentioned Chile. We we had a guest on recently who was talking about it. What do you make of the political situation there right now? Um, it, I never thought of Chile as a as a place with a lot of political risk. I thought that was one of the cool things about it, but maybe I was kind of wrong about that. <laughs> uh, Chile is snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. If you look at the success of Chile in the last 40 years, it, it's been uh, partially a consequence of their uh, natural resource endowment and partially a, a consequence of um, fairly good policies and politics. Chile has moved from a poor nation to a rich nation. It's not a middle income nation anymore. It's a wealthy nation, particularly in the, in the Latin American context. And, and there are pressures now uh, for redistribution rather than creation, uh, which is to say that we're going through the Americanization of Chile. Uh, I, I think that's very sad, uh, but I also understand it to be true. Make no mistake, it's still not a bad place to invest in mining. It's just getting worse. Uh, it has a wonderful geological endowment. It has wonderful infrastructure. It has wonderful management, wonderful uh, talented, skilled workers. Uh, it has, like California, this wonderful thing that stores water in the form of snow in the winter and delivers it via gravity <laughs> in the summer. Uh, you know, it has all kinds of wonderful attributes. It has a, a, a nice ocean which supplies them uh, with things like fish, but more importantly, uh, cheap access uh, to world markets. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of its attributes, which used to be a political understanding uh, of the nature of the Chilean economy, is fading fast. So almost 40% of, um, of global production is between Chile and another country nearby called Peru, Peru? which I don't talk about. I, I, I don't know anything about it, and I don't hear it discussed. When people say copper, the next word they say is Chile. Uh, but that nobody ever talks about Peru. 
Uh, Pe Peru at the federal level seems to be getting a little bit better as an investment de uh, destination. There is a, a very active NGO presence uh, in Peru to disrupt mining at the local level. Some of the uh, NGOs are self-described green NGOs. Uh, others of the NGOs are what I would describe as red or pink NGOs. But most of them are watermelons, which is to say green on the outside but pink in the center. And the consequence <laughs> of that is that the local <laughs> politics around mining in Peru is very often challenging. Okay. I see. So then um, – would one one would have to assess that maybe on a what project by project or company by company basis? Yeah, absolutely. I think project by project and company by company. It is possible. The Lundin family has shown this. It is possible with focused local engagement uh, that the benefits of mining, uh, particularly if they're demonstrated before the project has started, can overwhelm. Uh, these NGOs, the Lundines have done a wonderful job of going into communities eight or 10 years before they propose to begin to mine them, providing mm -hmm. jobs for locals in site preparation, uh, subsidizing churches, drilling, uh, subsidizing, pardon me, schools, drilling water wells, doing the type of community engagement that counteracts uh, the uh, NGOs describing Marxist screed uh, in environmental terms. Uh, but what you need is an outfit that has the will and the tenacity to do this. So there are you uh, successes, uh, in, in fact, a rising tide of successes as the mining industry has learned from successful efforts that they can't leave it to the host governments to create the right circumstances. You know, there's a social rents in mining are often ch uh, charged by the center. So we have a saying in mining that the rents go to the capital. And the regions get the shaft. Uh, all of the money from taxation and royalties, of course, goes to places like Lima and Santiago. And the rural areas which host the mine traditionally have gotten very little of the social rent. Mercifully, that's changing. Uh, mercifully, the mining industry is beginning to be able to show the local community uh, how to salvage more and more of the social rent, which is extracted from the ore body by the capital. I see. Are we saying that... Um, too much investment by mining companies is diverted to the capital or are we Absolutely. saying that that actually, okay. I just want to make sure. Well, make sure. I, I mean, I think, I think any is too much, but that's, that, that's a bit extreme. Uh, but there is some val value. Traditionally what's happened in Peru as an example is that the social rents for mining, which is to say the value added taxes, the income taxes, the royalties, the payroll taxes, all those kinds of things accrue to the big thinkers in Lima. Uh, to be distributed as they see fit. Uh, and the regions that bear the costs of mining, uh, the regions that, uh, you know, host the facilities while they get jobs, which is a wonderful thing, typically do not get uh, compensated uh, for the infrastructure that mining uses, as an example. Uh, in areas where there are very large copper mines that generate very large economic surpluses, there are still circumstances where the surrounding villages, were it not for the mining companies, wouldn't have water, wouldn't have schools, wouldn't have power except for the mine. Uh, and they wonder uh, when the NGOs say that the foreigners are stripping all the wealth out of the country, given that they can see the wealth being generated, but they can't see the wealth being employed because they're not in the capital, believe the pinkos believe that story. Right. So I think you, you actually answered a question that I sort of had bounced around the back of my head, which does this dynamic then create an opportunity for the mining company to be a better friend to the region and to sort of demonstrate that in a, I need to say for way. the last 10 years, we've become much, much, much better at that. Uh, when I was growing up, not so much, you know, you had to get approval from the capital. Uh, so you went and pandered to the capital. Uh, and the capital would enforce their will on the region, even with a gun, if necessary. We have learned uh, since that social license is local as well as national, uh, and the companies have done a much, much, much better job at playing politics on both ends. It might be that when you undertake a local project that you give the central, central government credit for it. Let's say that you build a school uh, in the local community. You say, 
at the suggestion of my good friend, the Ministry of Education. Uh, a, a lot of the villagers understand that, and the politician understands it too. You know, Rick, th- this is um, it's a weird world to find a libertarian oriented guy operating in. It's a world, weird world for a libertarian guy to operate in. I recognize that in a battle of power, I have the idea and they have the gun. And I am aware of the <laughs> asymmetry in that circumstance. And so I do the best I can with what I have. <laughs> yeah. Money is not a bad weapon. Just, to, you know, it helps. But it helps. It's not a gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not a gun, but it's not a bad weapon. All right. Um, we've actually come to the point where I ask my final question, um, which you've answered many times. And it is the same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's not a financial topic. And the question is simply, if you could leave our listeners with one thought today, um, besides going to rickevent.com, which I will remind them <laughs> again and again, I promise. Um, besides going to rickevent.com, what one thought would you like to leave our listeners with today? Uh, the best investment is in yourself. Invest in your own education. Uh, invest in the construction of your own paradigm. Uh, the biggest opportunity that you have and the biggest risk that you face is very conveniently located. It's to the left of your right ear and to the right of your left ear. And to the extent that you invest in yourself before you invest in the product of your education, you will do much, much, much better. Whether the way that you exercise that is by subscribing to Dan's newsletter or coming to my conference or by some other mechanism, determine what it is that you're trying to accomplish uh, and invest in yourself. Um, that's the word that I would leave you. The other world I'd leave you is, you know, uh, this is a rough world. Be kind, <laughs> you know, <laughs> be kind. Yeah. It, it's, it's good for the world and it's good for you. You come away, uh, feeling, uh, better about yourself and the same circumstance applies there when you're being kind, uh, educate yourself in what that means to you. Educate yourself in terms of your target, educate yourself in terms of your technique, educate yourself in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And then use that education to be kind. All right. We got a two for one. Very nice. Um, Listen, Rick, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And thanks once again for giving us your time and and coming back. Thank you. I look forward to hosting you physically in Boca Raton. Uh, Raton. I'm sorry. I pronounced it incorrectly. Uh, I look forward to having you down there. I look forward to uh, seeing many of your subscribers in person and probably many more virtually in the comfort of their own home. Yeah. Great. All right, Rick. Thanks a lot. And we will, I'll see you soon. See you in a few days. Thank you, sir. Many mainstream analysts are predicting that stocks will recover soon, but I say we'll instead witness a cash frenzy unlike we've experienced in 21 years before stocks recover. And I'm urging Americans not to buy a single stock until they see it. I predicted the Lehman Brothers crash in 2008, and I called the top of the NASDAQ in 2021. But this, this is the number one most important thing to pay attention to for 2023. And I'm not talking about another market crash or politics or inflation or any of these other things. As all this unfolds, the financial consequences of what I'm talking about could last for several decades if you don't understand what's happening. There will be winners and losers. And now is the time to decide which one you'll be. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about my warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.stockdeadzone.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get my four steps to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's www.stockdeadzone for a free copy of this new report. Always a pleasure to talk with my old friend, Rick. And of course, like I admitted during the interview, I had him on for selfish reasons because I want you to go to www.rickevent.com and, you know, either come to Florida or if you can't make it to Florida, you know, do the live stream. You know, if you're a mining investor and you don't know Rick Rule and you don't know all these people that he knows, like you've missed something. You know, if, you're a, if you want to make money in mining stocks, and I know a lot of you do, 
um, you know, there's no substitute for what he knows. There's no substitute for who he knows. He's just one of the biggest people, especially in that exploration space, you know, in Vancouver and Toronto, um, like everybody knows who he is and he knows who they are. He's educated me a lot about people, he you know, people to get with and people to avoid. So, you know, like I said, if you are a mining investor, go to rickevent.com and sign up for this thing and do what he says. Like there's going to be 55 hours of stuff over four days. You, you will, won't be able to take it all in. But, and if you really want to make money in mining, you will, you know, <clears throat> access it. I think you get six months of access if you sign up for the live stream, which is pretty cool. Um, and you'll want to go back and study it. As Rick said, he does. I mean, if he goes back and studies it, you and I sure need to. Um, and you'll want to because you'll want to learn all this uh, and you'll come away feeling a lot smarter and being a lot smarter about mining. And, uh, you know, I hope you also enjoyed the education that we got about Chile and Peru and and copper and and all the rest of it. Uh, it's always like that when we talk to Rick, isn't it? All right. Well, that's another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com, please. And also do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call our listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.